One, two, three. Welcome to the show. Geek Familia. Geek Familia. Welcome to Win Big with Clinton Sparks. It's time to get familiar. Joseph. Yo, Clinton Sparks, I love your setup here. It's hey. another level of excellence. Don't make me hit you with the... Get familiar. You get familiar, baby. Get familiar. Get familiar. You know what we do. What's going on, my brother? Man, a lot's going on. You know what's funny, Joe? That when I mentioned you earlier, somebody said I need to understand what Joe's skincare regimen is. How is your skin so... Why do you still look so fucking young, Joe? Yo, thank God, bro. Hallelujah. But I mean, like, it's just Dove soap. Like, I can go in the bathroom and just use <laughs> Dove soap. Scented or unscented? Uh, my Uncle Dan is right here in front of me. My Uncle Dan is maybe six years, seven years older than me. Yeah. He got skin. His skin is smooth. Yeah. My mother's skin is smooth. Like, I think it's hereditary. I think so. You know, at some point, you know, are we going to stop saying fat before your name? Because you look great, Joe. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. You said big, win big. I'm going to admit something to you I never admitted nowhere else. All right. Is I spent so many millions of dollars marketing fat Joe that it would not make sense to start the Slim Joe or whatever. I don't have <laughs> enough money to promote not so fat Joe as we have fat Joe. Right. Previously fat Joe. Previously on previously fat yeah. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> the artist formerly known as Fat Joe. Now, so I don't, yeah, but I, at this point, Joe the Don, I think everybody knows. Do you know what's fascinating is that, you know, one, you used to be the artist, right? That now you flip the script. And you're interviewing people, like trying to take my job and everybody else that's put 20 years of, of work into this. Like, I ain't out here trying to be a rapper and take your position, Joe. But you're out here being an interviewer and a great interviewer, too, by the way. You know, because it's just so natural. You're just having conversations, right? And like, what made you decide, you know what, I'm going to just start talking to people and bringing all these people uh, and start in becoming an interviewer. What made you decide to do that? You know, there's two levels of it. The first reason I really, really started was I started looking at hip hop documentaries yeah. and they were lying. They weren't telling the truth. Right. You know, I'm from the Bronx, the birthplace of hip hop. And so these, these documentaries was lying. And then when the credits came on at the end, I see why they switched it up to, 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 to go towards their narrative. And the actual executive producers were like people we respect. Right. They were changing history. And I was like, you know what? 20 years from now, a kid ain't going to know no better. They're going to watch these documentaries and think that's true. Right. So I said, you know what? I'd rather interview Snoop Dogg. I'd rather interview Buster Rhymes. I'd rather interview Brock Kim and find out the true story behind it. That was phase one. Now, if we talk about the Big Big Show, the Fat Joe Show, yep. on IG every, uh, every week there at 8 p.m., that was just out of fear. COVID hit, everybody was dying, I'm stuck in my house, and I really, really quarantined in my house for a year and two months. Right. So I really was home. I wasn't lying. That right. So my daughter was like, why don't you go on live? Before that, I don't think I ever really went on live, maybe once or twice. Really. So she was like, go on live and talk to your fans. Right. And then it became therapeutic, because every day we was talking about what was going on in the street. Where we before the vaccine was even a thought, right? You know, Lysol, the you know, just just trying to cheer people up at the same time, giving myself courage because I too was very very frightened and very very scared of passing to COVID nineteen. Right. So during during the time that you started bringing people on, were you just personally reaching out like, yo, I'm doing IG live, doing just jump day. on here? Yeah, that's how it started. Just just hit my everybody was stuck home. Right. Right? right. So, and everybody's on Instagram. Right. So I just start hitting my friends in the DM and telling them, yo, I got a show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I didn't know it was a show. I went on live one day at 8 p.m. Second day I went on live. By the third day, I said, this is a show. <laughs> I said, right. We're going to make this a show. You're like, yo, I'm a and host. You know, I'm a radio host all of a sudden. I'm a radio slash TV host. Out of nowhere. You never see, seen this coming. I never seen it coming either, but the, the, it was with good intentions. You right. know, hip hop was created 
in the Bronx when it looked like it was bombed and people were oppressed. Right, right. And people were suffering. The same thing happened with the Fat Joe show. People were going through pain. People were dying. People were scared. People, and then I just went on there and said, for free. Right. Just come on Instagram and let's talk about life. And that's, you know, that's the fascinating thing that happened this year that I think the world basically decided to all collectively kind of open up a little bit more um, throughout my career. One of the reasons I became successful in radio is because I didn't ask the cliche, typical questions like who you working with on the album? You know, what was it like working with this dude? Da, 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 or even try to instigate beef. I was never the guy that wanted to, if, if anything, I was the guy that was like, you know, why do you guys have to beef, man? Like, you're a cool dude. He's a cool dude. I talked to you both. Like, I know that you guys are good dudes. It's got to be people in your crew that are instigating this. Can we just make up? You know what I'm saying? Like, even back at one point when, when remember when Locks were mad at Puff about the publishing? Mm -hmm. Kiss was at my house. I was working on a record. There was these kids. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They were called Chester French. They were these two white kids from Harvard. They sounded like the Beach Boys meets the Beatles, but like had like a, like a, a nerd, like Pharrell nerd vibe to them. Right. Yeah, so, I, I didn't. I, I never heard of them. Right. So Kanye, JD, Pharrell, everyone was trying to sign yeah, these dudes. Yeah. Right. So Kiss came by my house. I was like, I'm trying to condense the story because it's a long story. This is when I had a deal with, with Puff with Ciroc. And I was the Ciroc boys. So they were like, man, how do you... And I was Puff's DJ at the time. So they were like, how do you, how did you get down? And they were asking me questions that like, you know, people ask people that are doing well, how did you do that, right? And mm -hmm. as they're asking me, Wale, because these kids were hot at the time, Wale texts one of them and says, yo, Diddy's talking about you guys on Twitter. So these are like 17-year-old kids from Harvard. They're like, oh, shit, this is crazy, right? So they hit up, they, they responded, and then I was like, yo, you know what we should do? We should make a song yeah, called yeah, Ciroc yeah. Star and get Puff on it. So now fast forward to Kiss being at my house, I play a beat, and it's the beat we made for that. I go, yo, Kiss, you should jump on this record. And he's like, <laughs> kazoon type. And then uh, I was like, yo, we're doing this record. You should jump on this. He's like, yo, Sparks, man, this shit is kind of hot. It's got a rock vibe, man. I'm, I'm, I'm with it. You know, Kiss, right? So then I'm like, dope. Here's the thing. Puff's going to be a part of it too, right? And I, he's like, yo, Sparks, man, what you trying to do, man? And I was like, come on, man. You guys got to make up, man. Like, let's just have a conversation. Let me call Puff. Just get on the call with him and sort it out, man. It's just, it's just some grown men shit to do. Here's what's bothering me. Here's what you can do to fix it. Can we sort this out? And like, I've always been a fan of resolution, right? And they got on the phone. We did the record. And the rest was history. No more than being mad at each other. You know what I mean? So I, I think like, you know, I love what you do too. Um, and I love that this year people started feeling a little bit more vulnerable, including yourself, to come out and start kind of opening up, um, you know, talking about your son, for instance. You know, I know that that really inspired even, even DJ Nasty. It inspired him to then talk about his son. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, Nasty, you know it's hard, man. We in a cool game where people uh, like to see your weakness or like to talk about you. You know, now with this whole cancel culture, they'll cancel you because they don't like the little colorful thing behind you. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, they'll cyber bully anybody. Oh, yeah, for and, sure. And uh, if you meet and you think thick, thin skin, it can hurt you. And so what happened to me was, you know, I used to have all these rap beefs, you know, my... <laughs> My reputation of being a tough guy. Yep. And my son's autistic, and I didn't think that he deserved people dissing him or dragging him. You know, hip-hop hip could be heartless. Right. But, you know, you are right. Uh, due to so many parents who realized that I had an autistic kid or a kid in the spectrum, kept hitting me up and hitting me up and saying, you know, we... We got the same issues. We got the same problems. We need you to speak up, Joe. And so I became more transparent and showed my son a little bit more and talked about autism and things like that just to help everybody and let everybody know that we all go through the same problems and the same issues. And see, that's the thing. For some odd reason, you know, when people become successful, those that, you know, celebrity-wise, the people that are not, seem to forget that you're a regular person. You know what I mean? And they hold you at a different regard. And like, 
you could be going through regular problems at home with your, your family or your wife or your girl or your kids or finances. And it's like, you know, people need to lay off, you know, you know, holding people like, man, but you fat Joe. Yeah. And I got a heart and I got feelings and I got a family, bro. Like, just like you. And I think that this year really brought down, it's something I've always championed and always um, did in my interviews was to bring people, you know, so people could see that they're human, just like you. You know, last night I had dinner with Nori. Yep. Nori's the last of the Mohicans that has 72 guys with him, the entourage of this. He's the last one that <laughs> still goes to Mr. Chow with 60 guys, right? <laughs> yeah. So he says, Joe, come with us. So I met with them yesterday. Actually, it was the first time I've been to somewhere like that in the last year where it was just a bunch of guys, whatever. We ain't great. But we had a real conversation on the table because I did Nori's show, Dream Champs, yeah. and I had talked about my issues with Big Pun's wife and stuff like that yep. without alluding to what I was talking to to everybody because they was asking me questions. It's like, yo, bro, I'm a human being too. I have emotions. Right. I have a heart. I have feelings. You know, I always got to be the bigger person. Right. You know, I could get dragged. I could get talked about. I could get this. And I always got to be Fat Joe, the bigger person. Right. You know, what about me? What about my feelings? Right. What about my heart? You know, what about my emotions? Yeah. What about your fears? What about your insecurities? What about, you know, all those things you think about at nighttime? Like, fuck, man, I wish the regrets. Like, everybody has these things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, people don't realize, like, you know, I'm not always in the studio making a hit record. I'm not always doing shows. I'm not always doing killer shit or buying Louis Vuitton and Gucci. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm struggling yeah. with my kid. Sometimes me and my wife are disagreeing. Sometimes I'm tripping over like this fucking bill that I'm like, why is this bill so expensive? You know what I mean? And then like mm -hmm. people will be like, are you Joe? You got it. But damn, dude, but maybe I don't want to spend it on that dumb right, shit. Maybe I don't got it. Right. Right. So maybe, so maybe, uh, you know, I have this recurring dream that hits me every couple of months, and it's of an animated project building with arms and legs chasing me, like trying to bring me back to the project. Wow. I always flip a negative to a positive and use it as motivation to keep me working and, 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 and just keep going, you know, because, you know, we grew up so poor, we grew up with nothing that no matter how much money you have, you never truly feel like it's impossible to fall back in a hole or go in a situation like that. Right. And so that's why I continue to work hard and, and grind so hard and try to elevate as a businessman. Right. You know, I, I wrote a new book, Joe. Um, I, I don't think you, I, don't, I haven't sent it to you yet, but I wrote a new book. It's called How to Win Big in the Music Business. Damon John, you know, FUBU, Shark Tank, he wrote the foreword. And one of the things, I'll send it to you, and one of the things that I say in it is don't be fooled by thinking because you made your dreams come true that you escaped your nightmares. Um, mm, let me hear that again. Don't be fooled by thinking because you made your dreams come true that you've now escaped your nightmares. Ain't that true? And that's what I think, Ain't you know, that the truth? it is, man. And a lot of people think like, oh, man, you rich or you're on TV or you got this car, or you got that. And it's like, you don't know that I'm still dealing with sexual abuse when I was a kid or abandonment from my father or like what my mother doing drugs or being bullied. Like, you don't know what lives and it doesn't go away. You become a grown man. Like you said, you got to be fat Joe. You got to tuck all that away and just be this tough guy, fat Joe. And sometimes people don't even realize that's what made Joe the tough guy. I had to be tough to survive. You know what I'm saying? That's a fact. Right. And, and people don't know. They Me just... personally, if I grew up in the suburbs with a family that had money, I'd have been a doctor or a lawyer. I'd have been uh, a nice guy. But, but, even, but even that, that Joe, was... even that's presumable because that's, you assume a kid that grew up there might have had better opportunities, right? They could have still had a dad that beat the shit out of them. They could have had a mom that was, you know, that ruined their family. You don't know. Everybody has their own problems. That's that's my point, right? And we just got to give people we got to give people a break 
and we got to give people some slack. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. We all just want to be loved. We all just want to win and be and get a hug. That's right. Right. And and I think that's what you're doing with your show. And Joe, one of the things that I've always loved about you, bro, like you know, aside from being an amazing performer, an amazing MC, and artist, you know, I've been a Fat Joe fan from day one. Before I was Clinton Sparks the DJ, I was playing your records right in my bedroom. And and like when I became friends with you. I just admired the way that you were always, all, you could have the fucking biggest hit on the record. You were still just a regular dude that was humble and grateful for the people playing your record. I'm still like that. I know you still are. still like that. And, and, it's, and you can uh, see it. You got to play this game out, man. You know what I mean? You got to yeah. realize that, you know, what happens is some people, they're gifted, they have opportunities, and hey, they deserve it. They right. made their dreams come true. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean you're holier than thou. That doesn't mean that you're better than everyone else. That doesn't mean that you're some type of God on the earth. You know, you should never forget where you come from. And the job is everybody who goes up in the hood says, yo, I want to get out of here. All right, fine. There's nothing wrong with getting out of here. But you, could you at least when you climb up the ladder, put your arm out? and try to help the next person who wants to come up behind you, that's what it's always been for me. Right. For me, it's always been about helping others succeed. Right. Helping others get an opportunity. How big of a stake do I need? Right. And, and, you know, I, I share it with three or four of us. Right. And show them you the know, blueprint. And, 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 and that's what it's about for me. And show them the blueprint of what you've built. Like, yo, here's the road I paved. You, it, you can walk up it now, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, and by the way, Absolutely. and by the way, it won't hurt to show a little appreciation to this road that I paid for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what, what would you say? By the way, speaking of loyalty, I want to go back to before I talk about your show some more. One of the things I want to talk about is the loyalty that you had and even or have to this day. Like, you've always been someone that everybody in hip hop recognized as one. Don't fuck around with Joe and his crew was one of the things that you knew not to do. <laughs> and two was Joe, if Joe likes you and you do right by Joe, he's a loyal dude. Like I, I can't even tell you how many times free shows I've seen you give, how many drops, how many freestyles, how many radio station visits. Like it was never enough. And it's funny because when I think about the legacy artists that have had insane success and are still around and relevant today, They've all had that same mentality, like a you or a little John or a pit bull or like these guys that were always, yeah, what do you need, bro? What do you need? I got you. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why you guys still matter. And that's why you're relevant. If that's not, a, if that's not an example for aspiring artists now that are watching or listening to see they are still relevant at fit, by the way, it's, it blows my mind how great you look and the fact that you, is it true that you drop? All the way up at 50 years old? Oh, no. All the way up was dropped at maybe, like, 46 years old. Like, that's fucking incredible. And, like, you know, the internet makes kids feel like if they're not a billionaire by 19 now, they failed. Well, Nipsey Hussle had it right. This game is a marathon. Right. And you don't want to just be an overnight success where... You know, you don't have it no more. And then, you know, you want to build this up. You know, you want to build up whatever business you do, whatever career, whatever you do. You want to build this up over time. Right. 100%. Whether that's being an artist, whether it's being an entrepreneur, starting a new business, it's the same rules are applicable to, to anybody. Don't be a dick. Treat people well and, and be grateful for, for the things that people do for you. One of the, you know, I got a funny story for you, Joe. Another funny story is, remember Hot 93.7 in Connecticut? Yes, sir. You were a huge, huge supporter in, in Victor Starr and everybody was a big supporter of everything you dropped. Victor Starr was a great guy. Man. He's, he's he one, is a great guy. One of the best to ever do it. You could, you could literally shit on a record and he would put in rotation. <laughs> That's man, how, he was a great guy, man. He, he still is. He's still programming in... Uh, in uh, I think he's in Denver, right? Yeah, with like Tasha Makia, who's out yeah, there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's funny because you were so loyal to that station. Remember, we used to have those um, those mix show uh, lunches where artists would come and we'd eat and we'd talk about the record and stuff. It was funny because somebody—I I don't want to call names. I don't want to cause any trouble. But there was somebody at the time 
that was down with you that you guys weren't down cool with each other anymore. And it was funny because that person came to push a record. And I walk into the meeting and all of our DJ friends are there that you and I both know. And I walk in and I'm like, what is he doing here? Literally right in front of him, right? They were like, oh, he's got a new record, da-da-da. I was like, I, what? Are you guys wilding? And, and, they were like, and they were like, what do you mean? And then that dude was like looking at me like, yo, is there a problem? I was like, well, yeah, no disrespect, but like Fat Joe is our boy and super loyal to this station and supports everything we do. And it would be wildly disrespectful if we were at this moment when you guys are not at the great, greatest relationship right now to, to behind his back support your music. And, you know, he was like, well, I respect that. I understand what you're saying, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, do you mind leaving the room for a minute? And he left. And then I'm looking at our friends, and I'm like, why the fuck would you guys ever even consider this when Fat Joe is our fucking boy, right? So then I go into the bathroom, and that person's in the bathroom. And I'm standing next to the urinal, and he's like, you know, there's two sides to every story. And I go, be that as it may. I go, and maybe you have a side that's, that's, that, that's justifiable. But the, the, the fact is, my loyalty is with Joe. And I think you should respect that. And he was like, all right, man, I respect that. And that was that. So who had man, your fucking back, story, boy? Man. Who had your back, Joe? That's a good, that, 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 that's a beautiful story, you know? Mm. Uh, loyalty is everything for me. Yep. And anybody who's been loyal to me, I've always had their back, one million percent. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all make our choices. You know, I had, I made some terrible choices in my life, in my career. You know, at one time, you know, I had beef with Jay-Z. I had beef with 50 Cent. These guys became the billionaires of the rap <laughs> game. Yeah. And I was like, yo, I fucked up. Like, <laughs> hey, this was not a smart move. Wait, so in the moment of having problems with a Jay-Z or a 50 and they started, like, growing, you actually thought, shit, I made a mistake by beefing with these guys? Well, I didn't think. I was, I, I'd have been a hallucinator to not know I... I ain't fuck up. Like, I was like, yo, these guys became the biggest guys in the game. Right. So now let's just say, I don't want to allude to it because they're both my brothers now, but, yeah. you know, they stopped a lot of my money. Right, right. As part as the beef. Right. Somebody who probably wanted to throw me a check, was doing business with them, and was like, just like you, you told homeboy, yo, you got to leave you, we can't listen to your music because you got a problem with my man. Yeah. There's other guys I sat down with other guys who, who wanted to give me a check but was like, yo, you got problems with my man. Right. You got problems with my man. And we talking about million dollar checks. Wow. And so I learned, I said, wow, this this ain't good. Well, it just go, it just it just so it just goes to show that fighting and beefing never results in positive endings. Never ever ever it's not worth it positive ending it's not worth it it's not worth let's sort this out guys what's yeah. your problem with me let's sort it out if i disrespected you let me own up to it and we'll get past it and then maybe we can do some dope shit together or just not beef if you still don't fuck with me that's fine but we don't got a beef well you know now we keep it all positive yep because we, you know we're losing too many of the youth yeah too yeah. many of the youth for a fighting over actual mute like killing over music Right. No, that's happening now. I know. Before, you know, we don't know who killed Tupac. We don't know who killed Biggie. You know, 50 Cent beef with everybody. Thank God he ain't dead. Me, I have many beefs. But now, you know, we used to think it was entertainment. Now it's entertainment, but these young, young kids, yeah. they're killing over these, these records. I don't know, Joe. It was pretty wild back in the day. I remember... It was always a stabbing or something happening like in the yeah, in the 90s or, or early 2000s. These guys ain't even big rappers. Like these are like demo rappers killing over right. songs that's on clout. social media. Or, or clout, yeah. Yeah, it's shit crazy. Yeah, they're going, they're doing the most to keep it real. Uh, and to, and yeah. for, for the gram, really, it's for the gram. Imagine if Instagram was around, you know, during when New York was on fire. Oh, we be in jail. We be in jail now for oh, 30, dude. 40 years. Lean back days. Like if, if, <laughs> if social media was around. Yeah, I know. Oh, fuck. thank God. Yo, the days when we were doing photo shoots for Vibe magazine and all us DJs were in the room. <laughs> social media was around that day.
<laughs> Holy Christ. You, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Joe, what woman, what woman played a significant role in helping your career? What woman kept you grounded and was the one that would always be like, Joe, I don't think it's smart. You shouldn't do that. I would say my wife, but she's Colombian and she always wanted me to walk. Really? She, she, she loved the tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. If I listen to her, I've been under the jail. Because she, she'd be like, uh, that's not a problem. Kill him. I'm oh like, Get familiar. Oh, my God. I'm like, what? Oh, just fucking off him. Just off him. <laughs> just send your boys over there. I'm like, come on. This ain't a fucking movie. Right. <laughs> You want me out yeah. here, right? You, yeah, you not only had to calm your own emotions, you had to then calm hers. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, on the flip side, she taught me everything I know as far as me cleaning myself up, uh, how I dress, uh, how I think about business. She's always been my backbone. Right. But when it's come to beefs and violence, man, listen, she was like, yo, go get those guys. She don't like nobody talking about her man or whatever the case may be. Right. So I would say she played the most significant part. My daughter's very, 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 very supportive of me. Yeah. Uh, my mother uh, raised my son, Joey, my oldest son, so I could have a career. I was going to ask that. While you were out being Fat Joe, you know, obviously your son needed even more attention. Like, mm -hmm. how, how were you able to handle that? That was your mom stepping in? My mom's and my father, and, you know, we've always had help for Joey since he was born. That's amazing. But Joey has never been alone, even if, even when he sleeps. Yeah. So while Joey's sleeping, there's somebody sitting there looking at him. Got it. While he's sleeping to this day. That's a lot of love. And, and so we, we make sure, you know, because, you know, Joey doesn't walk. Joey doesn't, he can't tell you he's hurt. You know, he can really hurt himself if you lose sight of him for one minute. Right. So, you know, we, you know, we had to be on top of him. But it wasn't for my mother. I wouldn't have no career. Right. Well, shout out mm -hmm. to your mom. And shout out to your wild wife for instigating those beefs. <laughs> we got to give her one, one for her, lick a shot for her. But uh, yeah. so, you know, being a, a wonderful father, first of all, that's, you know, I love you to death for that. Um, because, you know, one of the things I, I, my biggest pet peeve is deadbeat dads. Um, and they're the worst. They're the worst guys in the world. Well, my biggest pet peeve is child molestation. Oh, of course. That's right up there. The two, um, two worst things. Um, these people should die. And deadbeat dads, like, how do you create a child and turn your back on them and not, not there for them? And, and you think you bought them a pair of socks. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing. I don't understand it. Don't like, either. you know. You know, my son's mother, when she found out that he was autistic, she was like, yo, I'm not raising him. I'm going to give him up for adoption. Oh, wow. And my mother and father and me, we stepped in with a hell no. He's ours. And so there's deadbeat mothers, too. And so she never seen him after that. She might have came to one or two birthdays, pretend like she's a mother, and she was out. Oh, so, your, so your son's real mother is not in, in his life? Never been in his life. Oh, man. Sorry to hear that. Ever so she wanted to give him up for adoption. So this deadbeat mom too, but I don't want to stand these people. Like I will cross deserts. Right. I, will, I will do whatever I got to do for my kids. Right. So I don't want to stand people like this. You know, a, a man, even a man who gives his son two pairs of sneakers and thinks he took care of took care of him. Right. If you ask me, yeah, I looked out for my son. I gave him two pairs of sneakers on his birthday. Right. Yo, but what about the other 364 days of the year? Right. Crazy, bro. I, I don't, and, and then, by the way, the, the, the ironic part is that same dude that's not a father is out here trying to get his rap career off. What a clown. <laughs> what, what a clown. <laughs> or like trying to holler at girls. Like, how do you even, as a man, feel good about yourself to say to a girl, yo, you should get with me? Like... I, I would feel like a complete fucking loser, unworthy of anybody thinking that I'm dope if I just left some dude. Well, that's or, why you are who you are, am who I am, and there's some people out there. You know, the world's full of a lot of bad energy. Right. You know, and so we got to keep the good energies 
out there and bring them to the light, like the single sunshine and the light, because right. too many people are up to no good. Right. Horrible people, man. So you mentioned um, equally as bad as deadbeat dads is child molesters. Is that something that you've encountered as a child? No, it's the lowest thing. I think it's worse than murder. Right. Agreed. And so I think... I don't believe in second chances for child molest. I think they should kill them. Yeah. I always say, like, you know, I think you rape, you rape a kid, you should die. It's just my opinion because I don't think they're ever going to change. I don't think this is some therapy shit Me do I. that you can change. You know, they go to jail and then they come out here and they rape another kid and kill a kid. Like, I have no sympathy for these people. Neither do I. I am somebody that's a victim of that for many years when I was young. So I totally get those that have went through it and it lives with you forever. Like I'm okay. It's not something that I struggle with. Did you wish he died? No, you know, I always grew up with a different mind frame. My mind frame was more like dissecting people's brains and why they do the things they do. That's how I've always been since I was young. So when I see somebody do something wrong, I really get into the psychology of, What's wrong with them? What happened to them? Why do they need this? Why, what feeling do they get from it? Like, what's the objective of doing this? Do they know what they're causing to somebody? Else? So I've always been that way. And I think it was probably because of being molested. Um, it started me to think, no, nah, it was before that. Cause I remember like, I was always like the only white kid in my neighborhood. So when I would see like all these Spanish kids, there was a Spanish kid that would like beat the shit out of this stray dog. And I remember, I remember when I was like eight thinking like, why would he do that? <laughs> cause that dog was my friend, you know, cause I had no friends. That dog was my friend and he, and he didn't like me. So because he knew I liked the dog, he beat the shit out of the dog. And I, and I remember thinking that was my very first thought of like, why the fuck would somebody do this as a kid? Well, I didn't say why the fuck I was a kid, but anyway, I'm like, why would somebody do that? But yeah, so I've always been, that's why I'm so big into resolution because I understand everyone's not built the same and everyone has different traumas and everyone has different ways of dealing with it. Again, I'm on the same page as you with child molesters. There's no excuse for that. You're out of here. You fucking, you, you revoke your ticket to being here on earth. But like everybody else, like there's other, there's yeah, things going on. Too, I think about these things, like why people do it or whatever the case. But when it comes to child molesters, drop a bomb on them. On <laughs> Collapse the building on them. Right. So that's what, Joe, you've done so many great things. What, what do you most want to be remembered for? If you, got to watch, if you got to watch all of us at your eulogy, at your funeral, what is, it, what is the overall consensus you would want to feel? I, um, inspiration, you know, inspire people to succeed, to never give up, to give back, to open businesses in your community, to do philanthropy, most of all. And uh, loyalty has always been my thing, man. And yeah. so just... People talking about his loyalty, you know, and people coming up out of nowhere that nobody knows. It could be a guy from Arkansas who lost their job as a radio, uh, uh, a radio personality. And they'll come up there and say, you know, when I got fired and I was crying and I thought my life was over, Fat Joe hired me. Yeah. You know, stories like that where people could, my kids could sit around and say, wow, my dad. He He's a great guy. He impacted a lot of people positively. And he went through a lot of trauma. Right. Growing up. A lot of evil around me. A lot of violence. A, a lot of obstacles. And he still managed to look positive at the world and try to give back to the world. I mean, that would be the, that would be the greatest honor for me. Right. And I think that's how people, in fact, will talk about you and speak about you. Yeah. In the unfortunate time, 50 years from now, when you maybe pass on. But one of the other things, too, um, I'm, I don't know if I have all the information right, but what I heard sounds amazing, and I'm super proud of you and excited at the outcome. Um, but obviously, whenever I think of Big Pun, I think of you, right, um, mm -hmm. and your association with him. And, you know, I look at you as the guy that introduced him to the world. What I've heard was recently you reverted all of his royalties and publishing back to his family. Is that correct? Yeah, but that wasn't recently. I said it recently, but I, it. they've had it for years. Right. Okay. So good. after he passed away, I gave them the rights to Big Pun. Oh, way back then. Yeah, maybe um, 
No, I wouldn't say way back then, maybe five, six years ago. Yeah. Uh, because I never made a dollar off money. Right. He was always unrecouped. And, you know, there was this back and forth with, I think Joe stealing his money is this and this. So I got uh, sued. His wife sued me. And then in the mitigation, the judge tells her, I don't know why Mr. Carter Jean is here. Like, it's, it's, you know, this guy doesn't owe you nothing. Right. He never stole from you. He doesn't own nothing. This, that. And so I asked my attorney in that meeting, I said, how does this never happen again? How does these people don't accuse me of, of stealing from them, ruining my reputation and this? And he said, well, you just give them everything back. Right. All the rights, everything. And I just said, well, then do that. Right. I just gave her the rights and gave her everything. And, you know, it's crazy because everybody, you know, that's what she wanted, the rights and all that. And so now when they start speaking about doing a big pun movie or doing anything like that, they keep saying, oh, we need Joe to do it. We need Joe. But, bro, y'all didn't want Joe involved. (laughs) What are you talking about? Nobody wanted Joe involved. Nobody, you know, you got everything back. You live in a... Like, not on top of that, you want me to do it? Right. It's a horrible place to be in. It is, for sure. It's it's difficult because you love the dude and you obviously want, you don't want his family to be, you know, kept away from his legacy and what's coming to them. So, you know, it was the right decision. And unfortunately, you had to go to court for it to come to that point. You've interviewed a lot of people during your show. Um, Mm -hmm. What is the most, what is the most shocking story you heard from somebody that you can't believe that they told you this story? The greatest story I've ever heard on my show, there's two, and they're both involving Michael Jackson. All right. Uh, Bobby Brown came on my show and said he taught Michael Jackson how to do the moonwalk. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) please. Oh, my God. First of all, first of all, that's some Boston shit. Let's go, baby. <laughs> but, yo, how is that? Do you think that's true? I want to believe Bobby Brown, and I want to think that he said it out what he truly... I believe that Bobby believes that. Now, I've been hearing that the guy from Shalimar taught Michael Jackson how to moonwalk. Right. So when I went to Emmanuel Lewis and I went to everybody that actually knows MJ and all that, they say the guy from Shalomar. The second one was... Wait, 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 before you move on to the second, because that's, that's a really big claim. So when Bobby said that to you, what because my response would have been what you just seen. What was it your response? My mind, but I believed Bobby Brown because, you know, it's Bobby Brown. But Bobby Brown would have been, so when Michael Jackson first did the moonwalk, first of all, we'd have to find out the date that he first publicly did it, right? Bobby would have been... He did it at the Motown uh, 25th so, anniversary, but the thing is that Bobby Brown was hot at that time. Was he? Because what year was the Motown anniversary? Because I know yeah, that's... New Edition, been, New Edition was hot since they were three years old. Well, Okay. Mr. Telephone Man. Well, three years old, they would have been like, meh, 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 meh. <laughs> three years yeah, old. It's believable. Right. Okay. It is, be- it is believable. All right. Snooping around. And if he said it with, and if he said it with that, with conviction, how could you not believe it? All right. So Bobby, not, not believe so Bobby Brown it. apparently taught Michael Jackson how to do the moonwalk and revealed that to you. He's never said that before publicly. No, he revealed it to me. All right. And what's the second shot? The second one was I have Reverend Al Sharpton, good Reverend on the show. And you know, Reverend Al Sharpton was raised by James Brown. So Reverend Al said... Wait, so literally, you know, like as a dad or musically? Like a dad. Reverend oh. Al and, and, and James Brown's son grew up together in church and they were preaching together. And then James Brown's uh, natural born son, he died in like a car accident. Got it. When they went to the funeral, James Brown said, you're the kid that used to be with my son. You're going to be like a son to me. And they literally, 
That's why Reverend Al had the hairdo, yeah. James Brown hairdo. He yeah. took him like a son. Right. Now, James Brown passes away, rest in peace. Four in the morning, Reverend Al gets a phone call. It's from the morgue. And they say, Miss, Mr. Sharpton, uh, Mr. Jackson is here. Can we let him see James Brown? Michael Jackson. Yeah. So he says, sure. And so Michael, he said he got on the phone with Michael. He was like, Michael, we would love to see you at the funeral. This is the time Michael was in controversy and all that. He was like, yo, I don't want to go there. Right. People, you know, too much controversy, whatever. He yep. said, okay. He ended up showing up too. But Reverend Al said he called back like an hour later and told the mall guy, yo, he said, uh, how long he stood there? He said, he stood there for an hour. And he said, well, what did he do? He said, well, he talked to Mr. Brown. And he asked me for a comb. And he combed James Brown's hair the way James Brown wore it. The, 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 the mortician or whoever styled his hair had it wrong. Wow. And Michael Jackson was saying, Mr. Brown wears it to the right. So he combed James Brown's hair. That was mind-blowing to me. Oh, this, this shit is great. That's true respect and love right there. I'll tell you that. I mean, that was his idol. Yeah. All the dance moves came from him. Yeah, there's a bunch of things. Those are the two most legendary stories that come to mind. I love what the the one show was when you had um ah uh, what's her name from New York, the dancer that everybody loved, Mookie. She said Mookie. Rosie Perez. Rosie Perez, and you had Rosie on. I loved watching you guys talk. Cause I could because it just seemed like two people from around the way having a conversation. You could relate everything that you guys were talking about. Joe, love you, brother. You are one of the best to ever do it, man. You're such a great father, a great MC, a great man. Thank you for what you've done for hip-hop. Thank you for what you've done for culture. Thank you for always being a friend to me. I love you, brother. Thank you, my brother. Number love, man. It was an honor to be on here. Shout out to your family, your wife, everybody out there, man. God bless you, my brother. Let's go, man. Take care, buddy.